All right, Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to talk about how to get power from God. How to get power from God. Now, I trust in our last lesson that we received a big blessing. I have to keep the stuff in this whiteboard because they're going to connect the dots. But I also have to erase some stuff and then uh, write some new things here because we're going to cover some new things. How do Christians receive power from the Lord? If you hear sermons nowadays and topics that churches are interested in, it's to receive power from on high. Now, everybody wants power in their life, believe it or not. Everybody wants power in their life. Uh, that's the reason why a lot of people, they'll try to get uh, rich, gain a lot of money because they want that power. And there are people who are rich and wealthy, but realize that money cannot buy them power, which is why they give up their money to become running for presidents, for example, or running for government offices so that they can have some kind of powerful position. Uh, you'll see charismatic churches nowadays talk so much about the power of God and they have no power whatsoever. Money. What they got is a bunch of devils in them with the speaking of tongues, healings, nonsense. And it became such a horrible testimony that unbelievers, atheists, and other lost people, they witnessed that. And then they say, that's a joke. That's not Christianity. So we want to show real, genuine Christianity that has real, genuine power. Now, one of the things that is very powerful that even the lost world cannot deny, and when they see is from your very own living. That's right. wow. How you live your everyday life, from your testimony. And when lost people observe that, they realize that, wow, there's something real that he or she's got that I don't have. And then they start to ask you questions. They start to realize that the things that they got into in their lives have no real meaning. And they're searching for answers. They're searching for meaning. So then they come to you. As a matter of fact, people who start to see issues with their own church, their own religion, yeah. and their own beliefs, they start to search for truth. Yeah. Then they realize as they're searching for truth, you know what happens? They eventually get to you. Yeah. And then they realize when they get to you, it stops there. Yeah. Now, most of you know what I'm talking about, right? Because most of you have been searching for truth. Most of you have tried out religions out there, went through stuff online, graduated from universities, and realized that as you were trying to search for truth, you ended up right here. And I think it's a, uh, I think it's a pretty good deal because you're still Amen. in here. Yeah. So I think you found it. Yeah. So that's the blessing of being a Bible-believing Christian and what we got. Hence, it is very important to study more into our Bible-believing faith, in our Bible-believing Christianity, and delve into more about the stuff that we have that gives us power, that gives us realness. That's what the whole world is looking for. I've explained some areas where you receive power. Now, the most obvious thing when you talk about receiving power from the Lord is the filling of the Spirit. When the Holy Spirit fills within your life, you gain power. We've heard great stories about revival preachers, how they were able to draw in literally hundreds to thousands of souls to salvation, get them on the altar, weeping, repenting over their sin. People who are unbelievers, who are atheists, people who are stuck on drugs and addiction, who hated Jesus Christ, all of a sudden they transformed their lives and people never saw anything like that before. That was the uh, power of God right there. And those revivalists would mention so much about the filling power of the Spirit. So that's a no-brainer. The filling of the Spirit comes to mind when we receive power from God. So we talked about several things to receive the filling power of the Spirit, which is on Ephesians 5. And they were singing, they were giving of thanks, and submission. 
So these three things are very important to receive power from God. Now, we knew about that, but when I explained it a bit more, we realized how much we took them lightly, don't we? Or how much we even despise them. So that's why we don't apply them to our lives. We've got to apply them if you want to receive power from God. But if you despise these things, especially when it comes to that very moment that you should be doing them, but you don't do them, why? I guess because the power of the flesh is too great. Because we just don't want to, right? Or we just forget, or we just don't think about it. I don't know. The point is, however, we fail to apply them at the moment we should be applying them. If we only did it, then we can receive power from God. So we talked about that in our last Bible study on how to get power from God. Now these are the basics, but then it started to expand more. Then we talked about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Your gift, what you have for the Lord, are you implementing them? If you're not implementing them, that's the reason why there's no power in your life. Now, all of you have a skill, a talent, and a gift. You've got to be using that for the Lord. If you don't use that for the Lord, then you don't have any powerful effects coming out of your life. We compared it with Ephesians chapter 6 on the full armor of God. Now, I strongly believe that the full armor of God is not only, it's not only to protect you from spiritual attacks. It's not only necessary for spiritual warfare. The armor of God is what a lot of people don't think about, the key and the access to receive power from the Holy Spirit. If you recall, I mentioned to you that Ephesians 6 continued the context of Ephesians 5 on receiving the filling of the Spirit. Because of that, the armor of God is very important to continually receive spiritual power, not just spiritual warfare, not just your defense against spiritual attacks. That's important that a lot of Christians don't think about. They just think it's just warfare. It's needed for warfare. They don't think about that it's necessary to receive spiritual power. When I talked about certain parts of the armor, I've explained to you that each part of the armor, why it is important to receive power from God. You remember that one? So we talked about all parts of the armor, why they are important to receive power, and that they were tied to other things to receive spiritual power from God. So this is the basis and foundation that I'm going to keep pointing out, and you're going to notice how they tie into other parts of receiving power from God. For example, there was the power of binding and loosing. That's something that the Catholic Church really tries to harp on. And unfortunately, that has been abused during the Dark Ages and even today, yes, even today, where poor souls are terrified about the salvation of their own state and whether their sins can be forgiven. So then they always go confessing their sins to a priest. Now, after our trip in Europe, we saw these confessional booths, and it's just totally ridiculous. Amen. It was actually deeply upsetting Amen. and even grieving to some of our people. It just made me stinking angry, actually. I actually want to go inside a confessional booth and pull up a joke, actually. That's how disgraceful I want to do it because it just deeply upset me. Now, like I told you before, some people who might hear that from me might get like offended or might go, whoa, that's too much, but you won't know that until you get there yourself. That's right. Like I told you before so many times, because we're stuck in our American bubble, our American locality, we don't understand what's going on out there. Until you actually go out there and see for yourself, you go to the dark parts in Europe, and then you see what they do in confession and those Catholic, poor Catholics confessing their sins and then those right. priests 
uh, wrongly using this power, which is so demonic, it's just a messed up system, then you'd understand why I'd say this kind of stuff. But people who won't understand that kind of stuff are people who are typically stuck in liberal California watching TV. All right, so that's the kind of uh, brainwashing system that we're stuck in nowadays. Uh, until you go out there and see for yourselves and you'll understand. So it's a healthy thing if you were to just go out. Now, sometimes I ask this, all right? Sometimes I ask, uh, this with people who do not understand our Bible believing faith or the way we teach or we preach is have you done soul winning? Yeah, come on. Have you witnessed? Have you gone out of your comfortable bubble, your house, yeah. where all your world is TV and your own world? Right. And you actually dealt with real life people out there telling them about the gospel, yeah. actually ministering to people in church where you actually counsel them about their troubles they're going through, discussing their own wrong religious beliefs, and then dealing with their sinful issues and all that. Have you ever done something like that before? When, especially if you get outside of this locality. Have you been on a missions trip? That will especially be eye-opening. If you've never done that, you're not going to understand the way that we teach or preach here. Instead, you're always going to get offended and sensitive and alarmed, and you're not going to understand that. Okay, so it's important to understand that this power of binding and loosing, like I mentioned to you before, it is very disgusting about how it is used wrongly by the Catholic Church. It's very abusive. This power of binding and loosing is not restricted to religious elites. We strongly do not believe in that. This power is given to every child of God, who believes on Jesus Christ for his or her salvation. If you're saved in Jesus Christ, every one of you has that power. You are not enslaved by some religious elite. That power is yours. Now, this power of binding and loosing, it is tied to the armor we've seen. Like I've told you before, this is the foundation that's going to connect to other powerful things. The power of binding and loosing, which is what? Forgiveness of sins. How do we offer them forgiveness of sins? Like I told you before, the only way you can give them forgiveness of sins is to lost people. For lost people, you give them the gospel. That's how they receive forgiveness of sins, through Jesus Christ. You are not the one forgiving them of their sins. You are not the one who has the power to forgive them of their sins. Jesus Christ is the one who died and gave them forgiveness of sins. However, that power, Jesus handed it over to you. So you, as you give them that gospel of Jesus Christ forgiving them of their sins through faith, that's how they receive forgiveness of sins. And in that sense, you have the power to give them forgiveness of sins. Do we understand here? So that's the power of binding and loosing that you have a forgiveness of sins for lost people. For saved people, we have the power of forgiveness of sins through, actually, it's more simple than you think, forgiving each other. That's why we take forgiveness seriously in this church. Uh, bitterness is a definite no-no in this church. You have to forgive each other. Why? It's a power. It's a power from God. Amen. You have to forgive one another. Why? Even as uh, Christ hath forgiven you, you have to think about it that way. Not only that, in 2 Corinthians 2, when you forgive someone, Christ is forgiving them. That's very important. So it's a powerful thing. That's why we practice forgiveness in this church. Why do we kick out people from this church? That's the power of not just loosing, where you loose the sins, forgive them, but that's binding. In the sense, their sin is retained. That's why we kick out people from the church, because they refuse to repent. They refuse the forgiveness. So because of that, if people commit the sin in the church, that just ruins the testimony of the church, that hurts people in this church, we have to practice kicking them out. You might say, well, why do you do that? Well, you try doing that, all right? Uh, look, obviously, if, uh, let's, let me give an example. 
There are criminals who do attend church. You're going to have them stick around your kids? <laughs> you feel safe? No, we practice kicking out from church. Why? Because if the person does not repent, if the person does not um, get the sins forgiven, then when they continue that practice, let's just forget Christianity here. Forget the Christian sense. In a secular, common sense, sense of mind, so to speak, it's not safe, okay? <laughs> so obviously you got to kick them out. But in the scriptural sense, when you kick them out, their sin is retained. Their sin is bound. For a lost person, their sin is retained when they reject your gospel that you give to them. So that's the power that you have. And that is forgiveness of sins that is connected to the armor of God, breastplate of righteousness. So the breastplate of righteousness is staying away from sin. It's to stay clean, purity. And that is connected to the power of binding and loosing. And this power is connected to confession of sins. Remember, to receive forgiveness of sins, you've got to confess it. And this power of confessing sins is connected to the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So now, I think it would be appropriate that we start here, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you might recall the shield of faith. So we have to go over here. Now, the breastplate of righteousness was also connected to the Lord's Supper, which is a powerful thing like I told you before, but I'm just going all over the place, so I cannot do that. I just want to stick to a topic that way you know where we're at. So the point of everything, though, that I'm pointing out is that this is foundational that can connect to other powers. You recall that, right? Now that we recall that, let me resume our topic here. They're all connected. They're all intertwined. We're going to go to the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the next power. We're going to go to the book of uh, Hebrews, please, chapter 13 and Revelation 12. Hebrews 13 and Revelation 12. Now, John MacArthur, he teaches a heresy that the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ it does not have power. Now, to be fair to those Calvinists, because Calvinists will always accuse you of uh, mislabeling them or misconstruing them, uh, they always do that all the time. And the reason why is because you can point out their error. So when you point out their error, they cannot defend themselves except to accuse you that you're mislabeling them or misconstruing them. Now, when you talk that way, that's not an intellectual way to argue. So I just see that as a lame way to argue, okay? I mean, if I'm going to defend my Christian faith against unbelievers, I'm not just going to simply say, oh, you're mislabeling us, you're misconstruing us. That's not going to convict an unbeliever. <laughs> All right, so that's just being fair. So the Calvinists, uh, they will insist that the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, it does have power to forgive sins, because Jesus died on the cross. And when he shed his blood, that very act, see? So that's what they're focusing on. The act itself is what gave the power to forgive sins. But they do not believe the very substance itself, the blood of Jesus, has power. Because they will bring some examples that what if Jesus Christ, I'm sure, when he was a little kid, you know, injured himself, and then he had a paper cut, or he tripped, and then his leg bled. So are we saying that, ooh, that blood has special powers when it dripped the ground? So it's not something mystical. So that's what John MacArthur tries to spook out Christians. So then they hesitate to sing about there is power in the blood, which I don't like. No, I believe in singing there is power in the blood. The blood will never lose its power. I believe those things are doctrinally correct. I believe the substance itself the substance, the very substance, the blood itself has power. Yes. Now, I don't want to go on an apologetic spree here, okay? I keep getting sick and tired of explaining myself, but I feel like I have to keep explaining myself, otherwise people will misunderstand me. The lesson is about how to get power, not on apologetics on the blood of Jesus. So let me just say this very briefly, okay? The brief version is this. The brief version against the Calvinist is that Okay, so I get it that 
you know, Jesus Christ, if he gets a paper cut, the blood drips on the ground, then, ooh, you know, so doesn't make a very good argument that the blood, the substance itself has power. I get that. But it's the same thing with any medicine bottle. You can get a medicine that's very potent and power in its liquid form. And that substance is powerful. But if I spill it on the ground, see that? It's a wrong act being made. And that wrong act does not heal the person. But that doesn't change the fact that the substance itself doesn't have power. It does have power, fool. So what's the point? The point is, you dummy, okay? This is why I don't like Calvinist intellectuals. They always complicate stuff when it's more simple than you think. Yes, I believe the act has power, but also the substance itself has power, Amen. as long as you use both of them right. Amen. Oh my goodness, to concentrate only on the act has power, not the substance, is very stupid. Uh, the medicine, just because I drink the medicine, the act, it's not going to mean anything if the substance itself has no power. Oh my goodness. All right, just shut up, okay? I don't like Calvinist intellectuals. I do not like theologians. That's hard to believe, right? Oh, wow, but what you just talked about was so theological and intellectual to me. Yeah, that's why I don't like it, all right? <laughs> I don't like that. That's just a pride mentality and a religious pious cloak to pretend how spiritual you are. You know what kind of person that I am? And that's what you notice so far from this teaching, right? I believe in being real. That's how I am. I don't believe in playing politics or pleasing people or, you know, being theologically intellectual. I believe in just being real here. So I believe in being real, whether it hurts your feelings or whether it pumps you up or whether you like it or dislike it. I could care less. I just believe in being real to you when I teach and preach the word of God. Now, anyway, let's go to Hebrews 13 and Revelation 12. I I shot off my mouth too long, all right? So that's, but a lot of times I feel like I have to explain myself so that people don't under, misunderstand me. Okay, let's try to concentrate on this topic on receiving power from God. The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ does have power. Notice in Revelation chapter 12, in verse 11, and they overcame him, that's Satan by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto the death. So the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ does have special powers. It's powerful where it drives away devils. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, but I think Schnebelen, uh, William Schnebelen, Schnebelen, I forgot how you pronounce his last name. He was into occult stuff and then into Satanism. As a matter of fact, he was so... Uh, deeply into it that he even developed not just an addiction into certain uh, abusive substances, but even the very own human blood itself. So he was into dark stuff. The only way he was able to combat that, overcome it, was through the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ replaced the craving over the demonic things that he was infatuated with. So he had to constantly plead the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ Amen. over him. Hebrews chapter 13 shows that the substance itself, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, has power. So notice here, it's not just forgiveness of sins. It is, the, it is very powerful itself. It does have power. Hebrews chapter 13, notice in verse 20, 20 Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, what will he do through the blood? See that? What will he do through the blood? Make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you which is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to him be glory forever and ever, amen. Notice what it does, it empowers you in your work that you do for the Lord, see that? It empowers you to make sure that you do a good job for him. The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, what's very important, we see confession of sins tied into it, but not just confession of sins, it has power. We've established that. It drives away devils. And Hebrews 13 explained to you that 
empowers you to continue on in your labors for God. So it's important that you plead the blood of the Lord Jesus. Amen. You will notice that when we pray, sometimes we will plead the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ to fall upon us, to fall upon this place, to fall upon the very actions that we commit or do for Him. The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is inclusive with confession of sins, like I told you before. So because the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ not only empowers you, but it's also powerful to cleanse you of your sins, you've got to confess your sins daily. That's tied to the power of binding and loosing, right? Tied to the power of the breastplate of righteousness, no sins, purity, correct? These are powerful things that Christians should apply in their everyday living. So the power of the blood can only be applied if you were to confess your sin to God. So how often do you confess your sin? If you don't confess your sin, then here's the problem. I'm going to talk about another power here that a lot of people don't think about. It's called the power of the flesh. Now, this is a power that you and I do not want. This is a power that you and I do not want. The flesh can be so strong that it can overpower you, and what it does, it weakens you. It makes your Christian life very weak. Why? Because the power that you're receiving here is the Holy Spirit. Spiritual. A lot of Christians don't think about that. When we're talking about how to get power, it's not fleshly power. It's spiritual power. If you want to get rid of spiritual power, all you have to do is empower your flesh. So think about this. When you sin against God, who are you empowering? Your spiritual nature or your fleshly nature? Fleshly nature, right? So what you've done then, get this now, you've put a dent in your breastplate of righteousness. When, and what you're doing is you're weakening your breastplate of righteousness and you're strengthening the power of your flesh. You are trading in, get this, you are trading in your armor of God for flesh and blood. Do you understand that? Yes. Now, in Ephesians chapter 6, when we get back over here, so your hand was there and we didn't read that, sorry, so go to Ephesians 6. In verse 14, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. So, the breastplate of righteousness is important to receive power from God, like I told you before. But look at verse 12, what we're trading in our breastplate of righteousness for. Verse 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. However, we're constantly thinking in verse 12, flesh and blood. See that? That's our weakness. We think fleshly perspectives. When you think in a fleshly perspective, you will dent your armor. You're trading in your armor for something fleshly. Verse 10, the context of the armor of God. Verse 10, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the what? Power. power of his might. But that's up to you if you want that power, see, from your armor of God, unless you want to trade it in for the flesh. Now, who's stronger, uh, your flesh or your armor of God? That's why it's important that there are times the flesh will win against your armor, right? So when the flesh wins against your armor, 
how are you going to pay that back? How are you going to destroy this? You have to go back to your power. Go back to the power of the blood. You got to go back to the power of the blood Amen. where you confess your sins and the blood cleanses it. That's how you get rid of the power of the flesh again. Now, there's enough, there are several ways to destroy the power of the flesh, which probably is the most important teaching out of everything that you've heard on how to get power. <laughs> because we destroy our power, that's why we don't get power. I think that's our, the secret. I think the secret to why we don't get power is we destroy it. We are destroying our power. If we get rid of the destruction, I think the power will come in more naturally. A lot of times you keep wondering in your Christian life, why am I not receiving power? Why am I not receiving power? Why am I not receiving power? Well, it's simply because of your flesh. You'd be surprised how much that flesh is 99% of the problem. So we've got to get our power back, correct? How do we get our power back? One is through the blood. So then we have to plead the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We saw 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, I believe, in our last Bible study. If I didn't, then uh, you just write that verse down. That verse says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, this ties to the blood, which is tied to what? Confession, right? 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, then the blood cleanses us. And this confession is, what does that mean? That means the power of binding and loosing that we don't take advantage of. That is a special power not given to religious elites, like I told you a million times. It's your power, but you don't use it. You don't use it. You need to use your power of binding and loosing where you can what? Where you can restore your power, where you can destroy the power of the flesh instead. All right. Through the power of the blood from confession. We've seen that. That is tied to what? That is tied to uh, the power of binding and loosing and the power of the blood and the breastplate of righteousness. Three powers connected to just one thing and it only takes 60 seconds lord i am sorry for this specific sin is that so hard to do <laughs> there's another way to uh, weaken the power of the flesh to weaken the power of the flesh which nobody likes to do but it is important to do. I want you to go to Galatians, the book of Galatians, chapter 2. Galatians, chapter 2. And then I want your other hand to go to 2 Corinthians, chapter 7. 2 Corinthians, Chapter 7. The best thing to weaken the power of the flesh is simply to kill it. To kill it. Now, obviously, I'm not saying to commit suicide. But the Bible shows that to kill your flesh is to actually make the lust of the flesh dead to you. That's the idea. So in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, Paul says, I, what? Am crucified with Christ. See, that's present tense. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself uh, for me. Okay, compare that. I know your hand is a 2 Corinthians 7, so keep it there. But let go of Galatians now and compare that with Romans 6. Romans 6. The power 
of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Now that is a powerful thing, amen? The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I have to leave these pictures there, otherwise we're not going to connect the dots, but there's just no room here, so <laughs> let me see what I can do. Uh, can they read this or no? Yes, they can. All right, death, burial, and resurrection. That's the next power of God that a lot of believers do not apply. What is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? It's applying that against your flesh. That's the best way to weaken this. So if you want to cancel out this power, you've got to apply the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. You can recall our Bible study, your basic doctrine on the victorious Christian life. The victorious Christian life is as follows in Romans chapter 6 regarding the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Christ. Notice in verse 6, the death of Christ, the crucifixion that Paul talked about in Galatians 2. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So there is a death of Christ where you know, where you know that the lust of the flesh, that sin is dead to you. Uh, why is it dead to you? Why do you know that? Because the flesh is not the real you. Come on. Fle the flesh is dead to you. You know who the real you is? The spiritual nature. When you got saved in the Lord Jesus Christ, God did not save your flesh. He saved your soul, which became a part of the spiritual nature. So that's the real you. If you were to realize that this thing right here is dead to you. It's not the real you. That's the first step to weaken the power of the flesh. But the step continues with the burial. The burial is as follows uh, when we look at verse 11. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So you've got to apply, not just know that sin is dead to you, the flesh is dead to you, but you also got to reckon it. You got to apply it. You know, dead corpses, when you look at their graveyard, they don't smoke, they don't dance, they don't cuss out God. Dead bodies don't sin. Why? Because they're dead. They really apply it. You've got to apply that death to your flesh as well. Now, when you apply the death to yourself, you have to realize there's something in you that craves for a replacement. Even psychologists, addiction therapists know that, that there's got to be a replacement for bad habits, for sins, for uh, addictions that you go through. So that's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You've got to replace it with something that you can live, that something something that's alive to you. And those are spiritual things. So, verse 13. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. See the resurrection and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. So, replace sinful things with spiritual things. I mean, you're not sinning right now. Come on. Why? You've replaced it with just sitting on your tail to the Word of God. Glory I think that's a good replacement. And there's plenty more. That's just one simple example. That's how you can cancel out the power of the flesh is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But a lot of people don't realize that this is connected. <laughs> it's connected to the filling power of the Spirit. You might say, why? Go to Galatians 5. If you recall, in our basic doctrine study, what did I teach you about the filling power of the Spirit? Uh, not just based off of Ephesians 5, 
But there are other three things that you can apply. One is desiring. Second is praying for it. The third is what? Yielding to the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit. Remember Romans 6? Yield your members as instruments of righteousness. Yield to something living. Yield to spiritual things. Yield to the Spirit. See, these are intertwined with each other. So Galatians chapter 5. Notice in verse 16, this is how you cancel out the power of the flesh. Galatians 5, 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So you've got to walk in the Holy Spirit, and then you can cancel out the flesh. But here's another interesting thing. We go back, it is intertwined with the armor of God. They're all intertwined here. How do you cancel out the flesh? You kill it with the sword. You cut it down with the sword, the word of God. Go to Psalm 119. Now, I know that your hand's still stuck at 2 Corinthians 7, so keep it stuck, okay? Just let go of everything else, though. Go to Psalm 119. Go to the book of Psalm 119. You got to cut down the sins of the flesh with the word of God. That's part of your armor. You got to apply the armor. Psalm 119. Notice in verse 11. Verse 11. Thy word have I hid in mine heart. See, the word of God is applied in your heart that what? I might not sin against thee. See, it cancels out the power of sin. Look at verse 9. Verse 9. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Notice that the word of God, it cleanses you of your sin. Now, this is very important. A lot of people don't think about that. It's a good thing you're confessing your sin and you're getting the blood to cleanse you of your sin. But not just the blood. What about the water from the word of God? You know, the Bible is not just a sword. It's also known as water. You know what Ephesians 5 points out? The Word of God cleanses you like water. So just because you confess your sin, great, but are you reading your Bible? You wonder why you fall back into sin. So you got to cut it down with the Word of God. That's how you can cancel out the power of the flesh. Now, as we continue on to cancel out the power of the flesh, remember this. We have to crucify it. We have to kill it, right? Yeah. When you crucify, when you kill the flesh, let's go back over here. We have to know that you're dead, right? And then we have to reckon. We have to apply the death, correct? Now, a lot of people don't think about this application, which a lot of people don't want to do, all right? The application of this will lead to this. I strongly believe that when we apply this, it's going to naturally lead to this. There are times that you can skip, the, uh, not skip, but what's the right wording for it? Um, there are times that you can just apply this. That's the best way to say it. That you can yield to the Spirit, do spiritual things. But believe it or not, if you do this, it can naturally lead to this. What do I mean by that, right? You're just talking in conundrum and mysterious, so I don't get what you're talking about here. So let's talk about the application of the burial. The burial, remember, is to reckon, to make yourself dead, right? You ever thought about what makes your flesh dead? You thought about that? What makes your flesh dead? You thought about that? 
I can tell you some things that can uh, make your flesh dead. We'll go to 2 Corinthians 7. Second Corinthians chapter seven. The Bible says in verse 10, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold, this self same thing. Now this is very important. Get this. The sorrow of the world worketh death. Now, that's the power of the flesh. Is that correct? Can we agree with that? Hence, verse 11, for behold this self-same thing, meaning because of that power of the flesh, what are we doing to come back against that? What are we doing to attack against that? That he sorrowed after a godly sort, repentance. Repentance. The power of repentance. What carefulness it wrought in you. See, you're being more careful. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. You get rid of the sin. Yea, what indignation. You're upset about your sin. Yea, what fear. You're afraid to sin. Yea, what vehement desire. You have a strong desire to do what's right. Yea, what zeal. You're passionate. To serve God. Yea, what revenge. That's great. Like basically you're upset about the sin that you pay it back. Nothing better than uh, when you skip your Bible reading, you pay it back by reading 10 more chapters. Does that make any sense to you? All right. In all things, ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. What's the point here? The point is, if you want to cancel out the power of the flesh, we have to apply the death against the flesh through repentance here. And then we've also seen confession of sins. We've got to apply repentance. Repentance is so important where we can actually get so much under conviction over our sins that we start to take action against it. We apply the death. When you apply the death, notice that it naturally leads to resurrection. It says, yea, what vehement desire. What's that? Desire to do spiritual things. That's resurrection. Yea, what zeal. What's that? That's spiritual zeal. Resurrection. Why? When you have the burial, it naturally, it naturally leads to resurrection. That's very important to understand. We have to kill our flesh. But see, we don't want to apply the death to our flesh. That's our problem. Because why? It hurts. Why does it hurt? It hurts your flesh. I thought you're supposed to hurt your flesh. Amen? Amen. Amen, brother. Uh, you you got to weaken it. Oh, but it's just so hard. It just stresses me out more. It tires me out more. It, wh what are you doing? You're weakening your stinking flesh. That means it's good. What do you want to do? Coddle your flesh? What do you want to do? Strengthen your flesh? Yeah, amen. Why do you think fasting and prayer is so powerful? It cancels out the power of the flesh. Fasting. You're forcing the flesh to suffer here. Now go to 2 Corinthians 12. Now that we covered suffering, that's the next power. It cancels out the power of the flesh. Go to 2 Corinthians 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. If the suffering of Christ through his blood, if the suffering of Christ through his death, burial, and resurrection empowers us, are we not identified with Jesus Christ suffering? Are we not crucified with Christ? Don't we identify ourselves with this death, burial, and resurrection? So why can't we apply that? See, we don't think about that. So when Jesus Christ's suffering gives us power, we have to realize that we identify our suffering with His. 
We've got to put his suffering upon our lives. We've got to suffer ourselves to gain power from God. It cancels out the power of the flesh and it increases the power of the Holy Spirit. It gives the filling of the Spirit. So go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Notice right here in verse 7. Verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. So notice right here something in the flesh. It weakens him. The messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my what? Infirmities. That's something that hurts your flesh, weakens your flesh. That the power of Christ may rest upon me. So notice right here, you gain power from Christ. Notice in verse 10, therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in, ne in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. See, what's going on? Why are you strong? See, when you weaken your flesh, when you cancel out the power of the flesh, you're strengthening your spirit. That's what we're all aiming for. How to get power. We don't think about this. How to get power is this thing must die. That's why you don't get power 90% of the time. This thing is too strong. This thing is too comfortable. This thing must die. If we go back to Ephesians chapter 6, We cover the part of the armor that I have not mentioned in our last Bible study, which is verse 16. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Let me cover that part now, because I've been ignoring that. Uh, the shield of faith is, um, is probably... The most important armor against things that weaken your power in Jesus Christ. You might say, why is that? Because notice right here it says, above all. You notice that? Did you notice that in that verse? Yeah. Above all, taking the shield of faith. Up, above what? Above all, everything else in your armor. That doesn't mean it's the most important armor. What it's trying to point out is this armor is the most important in the context of what? Things that can weaken your power. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Why is that important? I don't get it. Because remember, how do you receive power from God? The most common answer people will tell you is a filling of the Spirit, right? Now, there's a verse that says, quench not the spirit. So the devil's job is to quench or weaken the power of the Holy Spirit in you. If that's the devil's job, is to quench the Holy Spirit power in you, then you don't receive the power of God. But what quenches this quencher is the shield of faith. The verse says, the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. See, this thing quenches this in return. That's why it's above all the other armor. That's important for you. So... Faith is the victory, as one song goes, correct? Why is faith powerful? Why is faith necessary? Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. But there are too many verses on that. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11 and 1 Corinthians 13. Hebrews chapter 11, and then we'll go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 
believe it or not, uh, I still got more to say. I thought I'd finish tonight. So I don't know. We'll see. All right. There's a lot here to receive power from God, isn't there? And these are things that we're supposed to know, right? These are things that have been preached and taught, but we just never thought of it that way before on how much we've traded our power. We've cut off our supply line to attack things in this life that we needed. Let's go to uh, Hebrews chapter 11. And then the other one is 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Why is faith powerful? Because notice in Hebrews 11, 1, verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Verse 3, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it being dead, yet speaketh. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. Uh, verse 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please him, etc., etc. Okay, let me, uh, if I keep reading, then you're all going to get bored because it's self-explanatory. But what's the point? If you read all of Hebrews chapter 11, notice faith was important. What? Faith was important with verse 3, the beginning of God's creation for all the world to exist. Verse 4, for Abel. Uh, verse 5, for the rapture to be enacted. Can you think, uh, imagine that, right? Yeah. Verse 6, faith, without faith, it's impossible. That's how important faith is. Seven, Noah saved his family. Eight, Abraham was able to have a child. Uh, verse uh, eight and nine, uh, verse eight through eleven, excuse me. Verse twenty-three, Moses, all the forefathers. Faith was so powerful that people were even able to withstand torture and suffer for Jesus Christ. Only faith can do that. Now, that's strange. That's a strange power of faith. Faith is so powerful that when these martyrs were singing hymns as they were being burned alive at the stake at the Colosseum, no. Roman pagans saw that and they could not deny this strange power that Christians had that pagans did not have. And that's what drew them to salvation in Jesus Christ. Now, get this. That power of the shield of faith, their very own act of faith, was able to get them to enact their power of binding and loosing and the gospel of peace upon unbelievers. Wow. So here's the thing here. If this power ain't working for you to lead others to Christ and they reject this power from you, how good is this power from your life? When pastor keeps telling you, you uh, just pray for them and be a good testimony, you all take that lightly? Come on, brother. That's good. Listen, if you want your lost loved ones to get saved, I don't think they're going to get saved if you don't attend a Bible-believing church faithfully. I don't think they're going to get saved if you don't live well for the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't think they're going to... I mean, it doesn't matter how much apologetics you know. if this power is being weakened. See, that shield of faith is so important because why? Be then they can finally see that and then this power can probably reach them. It's a shield of faith. It's so important, so powerful. Faith is so powerful that the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, 1 Corinthians 13, in verse 2, verse 2, the Bible says, And though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains. In other words, this passage shows that the power of faith can even remove mountains in your life. You know, Jesus Christ actually told his disciples, if you have faith as much as a grain of a mustard seed, until this mountain be removed, then it will be removed. 
Faith is so powerful that Jesus Christ even says that it will literally shake up all of creation itself. That's the power of faith. And I believe it. It is so powerful, it will literally shake up all of creation. Uh, the reason why I believe in that is because of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3 that we looked at. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Faith is so powerful that creation depends on it. That's what I strongly believe in. Faith is that powerful in the Lord. Now, this strange substance of faith, uh, how it works, where all creation is dependent upon it, is as follows. What is as follows is this. We know that all of creation, natural laws in the universe, including mountains, they're all dependent on the laws of science, correct? It's, it's irrefutable. Science is science. Uh, whatever you empirically prove or experiment with, I mean, you can't go around the, the scientific th uh, laws and hypotheses, laws of gravity, laws of thermodynamics, et cetera, et cetera. These laws are pretty much irrefutable and cannot be broken. Science is science. But there are things that science cannot explain to you. And scientists will admit that. Why is that? There are things that scientists can't explain, for example, even in scientific perspectives, about love. Science cannot explain to you what love is. It might tell you the emotions and then certain drives, but it can't define you love. And science don't even define you math, believe it or not. Science doesn't uh, define to you mathematics. Mathematics is concepts that we constructed ourselves. A lot of people don't tell you that. But anyway, I'm not going to get philosophical on you, okay? I'm not going to get into scientific semantics. The point is, it, through some of these examples, that science uh, cannot explain everything to you. Even scientists admit that. As a matter of fact, science cannot even explain science. That's the easiest example. And you might say, no, that's, uh, that sounds contradictory. I don't get that. No, science cannot explain science. And the easiest examples to explain to you are certain substances throughout our universe that scientists still cannot find an answer for. They still throw out hypotheses and theories, but they cannot get to the answer. And they even admit that their hypotheses can change even though they experimented with it and proved it themselves. That's why they hesitate to use the word proof. You know why that? You know why they hesitate to use the word proof? Because they can't prove it. <laughs> so uh, that's why I'm trying to tell you science ain't that irrefutable. It cannot explain things. Because there are some phenomenons in our world that natural explanations, natural scientific explanations cannot answer for you. Certain phenomena, for example, spiritual phenomena. Science can't explain to you when a man has his sensations all conjured up in pain and uh, burning at the stake that he'll cling on to his faith and not deny Jesus Christ when the body contradicts otherwise. See, it contradicts science. What does that mean here? What that means is this, is that Faith is that much stronger than science. And creation can only continue because of God. And God's not dependent on science. Science is dependent on God. And God demands you believers to have faith in Him. See, that's why all of creation rests upon faith. Faith is that powerful. That... All the laws of science, get this now, all the laws of science won't be able to overpower your faith. That's how strong and powerful faith is. That's why this power, how well are you using it or you take it for granted. <laughs> Ain't that strange? We take this thing for granted. We walk by faith, the Bible says, not by sight. What is sight? That's empiricism. What is sight? That's science. But the Bible says we walk by faith, not by sight. That's an incredible power that we have.
All right, and I have to do a part three, sorry. So there's a lot here. <laughs> there's a lot here to talk about the power of God. So I will give part three on continuing the topic on how we receive power from God. Father God, I pray that tonight's teaching was a blessing to our hearers and may we apply these concepts and practices into our spiritual daily living and make the power of God real to us. Oh God, we act like dead Christians and God, that's not a good thing. We got to believe that what we have is real and that we have power. Help us to apply these things into our daily lives and please you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.